that introduction, I, I didn't get a chance really to go through the list of um, lectures, and I don't, uh, and I still haven't sent you guys the email link to the course webpage. But the course webpage will have a list of the um, topic lecture topics on, on the specific dates and who's giving the talk, and it's organized pretty much the same way that the CBSC research portfolio is. We currently support about 27, 28 different research projects. Um, and then those research topics are reflected in the lecture topics here. And so the PI of each project, basically, I've asked them to give a talk or one of their senior research associates, meaning either a postdoc or senior grad student, to, to talk about that, uh, that project. Um, this year, I think mostly of PIs who are, who are going to be talking to themselves. So that's pretty good. Um, but just to give, get everybody on the kind of on the same page at the start, we want to cover some basics because uh, we're not sure whether or not you've been exposed to this formally before. And so one of the first uh, issues with biophotonics is understanding light matter interactions and what basic biophotonic instrumentation is like. Okay. And so for this, we've invited Professor Sebastian Waxman Hoju. Uh, he's our facilities director at CBST. He's also our uh, instructor in the Department of Pathology and uh, Laboratory Medicine in the School of Medicine. Okay. So with that, Sebastian. Oh, Sebastian, uh, uh, he's, he's had significant uh, research experience uh, from USC. Right? Uh, Cedar Sinai. Oh, Cedar Sinai, sorry. Yeah. And, and so yeah, he's very well qualified to be talking about this. Sure. Thank you very much, Frank. So it's really nice. Um, anyway, so it's good sometimes to talk to a smaller audience because it's uh, uh, more interactive and uh, you can learn a lot more. So. Um, so I'm going to talk just about uh, light in interaction with uh, matter, interacting with matter and the uh, basics of, uh, of uh, biophotonics instrumentation. Um, but first of all, just, uh, just present, let me present in terms of the field of biophotonics. So you have, uh, in biophotonics, you, you try to develop and apply photon-based technologies to make discoveries that are significant for medicine and biology. And uh, for that, you need to put together uh, knowledge from various fields, including physics, chemistry, biology, medicine, engineering. And uh, you are trying to look at all levels of organization, ranging from molecules, DNA, proteins, and uh, other molecules present in tissue and cells, going through cells and all the way up to humans. So it's a, it's a huge range that you're, you're looking at. So therefore, you can imagine that you need to look at different scales, microscopic scale, mesoscopic and macroscopic scales. And you need to develop technologies that are suitable for, for this. Okay, so the outline of the talk is, first of all, just briefly, what is light, which you probably very well know, um, what is matter, um, how they interact, different uh, ways of interaction, um, interaction with with molecules first, then interaction with semiconductors as a, as a different uh, component of matter, interaction with uh, uh, metallic nanostructures, metallic nanoparticles, uh, and then linear versus nonlinear types of interaction because we uh, m many technologies are developed based on the nonlinear interaction of light with matter, and then uh, uh, at the end uh, a little bit about about basics of uh, biophotonics instrumentation. So, as you uh, for sure know, light is uh, electromagnetic um, energy, and um, therefore it's one of the four fundamental forces in nature, the other three being gravitation, um, the strong force, and the weak nuclear force. And the photons are um, basically fundamental particles, so they carry energy and momentum. So, um, light as an electromagnetic wave can be, see, can be represented uh, as a wave and it has a wavelength uh, and a certain frequency. The energy can be represented in wave numbers and it's uh, uh, displayed here. But uh, just, to, just to see various ranges of uh, electromagnetic, the electromagnetic, electromagnetic spectrum can be uh, split into various portions including visible range, near infrared and mid infrared, far infrared, terahertz range, but also going down to ultraviolet and x-ray uh, region. And I just put he here together 
uh, objects that reflect the, the wavelength, really the wavelength that uh, correspond to, to, the, to the size of these objects. For example, uh, <coughs> X-rays range in the 0.1, go to 0.1 nanometers, which is about the size of uh, a water molecule. And if you go to terahertz, it's about 100,000 nanometers, uh, which is about um, 0.1 millimeters, if I'm correct, uh, and that would go to small embryos. And then you have in the visible range uh, the, the wavelength of light, which means that, that, uh, the distance between, between two peaks. So you have uh, uh, the visible range uh, between 400 and uh, 700 nanometers, corresponding to the to sizes uh, or to, to small viruses, basically. And then you have cells here, you have ribosomes, uh, you have uh, proteins, and you have uh, uh, amino acids. So uh, the main properties of light are summarized here, and um, light carries electric and magnetic field, so therefore it interacts basic primor uh, primarily with, uh, due to the presence of the electric field, um, and electric charges, interacts with electric charges, um, it has a certain frequency, wavelength, and energy, uh, as it was shown on the previous slide. There's a momentum, which is, uh, uh, can be represented as energy per speed of light. Polarization, coherence, it can interact with gravity, as you know, it can bend around uh, strong gravitational fields. Uh, photons can interact, um, and they are basically bosons. They can, more than one photon can occupy the same state. In, in, uh, on the other side, matter is fermions, so you cannot have more than two particles occupying the same state. So, uh, looking at all this, so if you have questions... Yes, have a question. Can you explain polarization? I, mean, I thought the light was pretty uniform in a photon. I mean, the photon is uniform. How are the photons polarized? So, the, po the photons are polarized in the sense that the electric field oscillates in one particular direction. So if, if, if it oscillates randomly, that is randomly polarized light. If it oscillates in a circular manner, it's circularly polarized light. But if it oscillates in one direction, light is polarized. And it propagates as polarized light. Polarization can be changed and manipulated according to our needs. But what it really matters is the electric field oscillates in one single direction. And this has several advantages. If you think of, uh, of charges that you want to interact, the light will interact with. So those it will move the charges in only one direction if you have polarized light. If you have no polarized light, it will move <coughs> the charges in uh, random directions, random directions. Maybe I can help clarify. Yeah. Yeah. It's just that um, what Sebastian is saying is that an individual photon has a particular orientation in terms of the axis of the E field and the B field. Right? Now, if, if those uh, orientations for a group of photons are the same, then light as an aggregate is polarized. But, but what he's saying is that individual photons carry that intrinsic characteristic. So each one, as it's, as it's traveling, has a particular orientation of each field. And so, so that's, that's the indication of the so, so basically, I'm not referring to one photon here. I'm re referring to, um, to uh, light in general, to a beam of light that has uh, a certain polarization and coherence. Again, it refers to a certain phase relationship between photons, and not to a photon in particular, but to, to a train of photons that have a certain re uh, phase relationship between themselves. So there are individual photon properties and then bulk properties. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's right. Okay, so um, light is very versatile. It has many properties. We can use each of these properties to to um, develop instrumentation that would allow us to look uh, at uh, various components. But now, what is matter? So, uh, loosely, what we understand with, uh, as matter is the is physical objects and the, uh, the substance they are, com they are made of without uh, the energy that is keeping everything together. However, physics, hardcore physics, defines as uh, matter the fermions, basically. Everything that constitutes uh, is constituted of elementary fermions. Um, okay, so and the bulk matter can be seen as metals where the, uh, the, the conduction and the balance band overlap. So you have uh, electrons that can flow through the, through the material, through the metal, 
Then you have semiconductors where you have a, a small band gap, it cannot, they cannot flow freely, but uh, you can help them flow. And then you have insulators where you have a large band gap, electrons cannot flow through these materials. And uh, just to, uh, I, I'm going to talk briefly about each of this interaction of, of light with each of this, with metals, with semiconductor and insulators, for for uh, for the sake of this of this talk, I'm going to consider molecules as insulators because they have a large band gap. You need uh, you need a lot of energy to to get one electron from from the ground state to the excited state. So I'm going to consider them insulators. So I'm going to talk first about molecules, then semiconductors, and then metals. Semiconductors, just because some of them can be used as probes in biophotonics, like quantum dots. And metals, about metals, I'm going to talk in the, in the sense that they, uh, if you have small metallic nanoparticles, they can be used as probe as well, probes as well. And the interesting uh, interactions that can, that can be observed uh, between light and small metallic particles. Okay, so uh, as far as molecules uh, is concerned, so we have this energy diagram that is called Jablonski diagram. So this represents the electronic states, which is the ground electronic states, the singlet state, S0, and the first excited state, S1. They're further up, they're, more, uh, they're higher uh, excited levels that are not represented here. But you see here also it's 0, 1, to 3, these are vibronic vibrational levels. So the molecule can uh, set can, can vibrate, and you have these uh, vib uh, vibrational levels. And then you have a triplet state here um, in, with, with a different symmetry in between the, uh, the uh, singlet le levels. So, um, as I said, you need energy to transfer one electron from the ground state to excited state. So, uh, therefore, uh, I, I treat molecules as, as insulators here. Um, so, and to do that, you basically uh, you can use light to to uh, transfer a photon, uh, a, I'm sorry, an electron from the ground state to the excited state. And this is called absorption. So everything we have around us uh, pretty much absorbs, more or less, absorbs light. So, uh, and this happens when uh, an electron in the molecule moves from, from the ground state to, to the excited state. What happens in the excited state is a quick relaxation in the excited state, which is a few picoseconds. And after that, um, the electron comes back to the, to the ground state uh, in form, uh, in, by emitting a photon, which is called fluoresces, or is not represented here, can come back just uh, uh, through different uh, vibrational levels, which would heat up basically the sample. So this process can happen in one step, which is one photon absorption followed by fluorescence, or it can happen in two steps, two photons add up, and this is a, called a two-photon absorption. Or you, may, you can have other um, processes that may happen, like second harmonic generation, where you put two photons and you get uh, emitted a photon with the same energy. Uh, please observe here that the energy of the emitted photon is usually uh, smaller than the energy of the input photon. And this is due to the relaxation processes. There is a stock shift here. The difference in energy is called Stokes shift. And then you have ray, uh, Rayleigh scattering, which I'm going to go into in more detail, Raman scattering, and other uh, sorts of, uh, in, of uh, interaction of light with molecules. But let me go now uh, to see them, uh, how they uh, all add up together when light is shined on a tissue, for example, or, or, or on any other sample. So if light is shined on a sample, this is, uh, uh, let's say, our sample. So uh, light can be reflected, simply reflected. Um, it can be absorbed. The photon is absorbed in, our, um, in, in the sample. A an emission uh, of, of another point of a photon can occur, or just scattering of light can happen. And the, the interaction, uh, the total interaction coefficient uh, is the, the uh, adds up out of these three contributions. And um, just to talk about each uh, interaction in particular, absorption, first of all, absorption. Uh, let's say here for, 
Um, uh, uh, we, let's take one molecule in particular. This molecule has a certain dipole moment in the ground state. And once it absorbs a photon, it changes the electron uh, cloud changes in the molecule and the, ch the, the, the dipole moment changes in the molecule. So absorption is basically a transition associated with a change in the dipole moment. And this is again represented here, absorption from the ground state to the excited state. Um, okay, here in this diagram, and I'm going to come with the same diagram for each process, I'm going to show intensity, wavelength, and how fast this process is. So uh, absorption process, uh, it shows a certain intensity, which is uh, basically uh, due to the absorption cross-section. And in wavelength, it shows a certain uh, spectral profile. And all these peaks are uh, basically... Uh, the, the first main peak is absorption from the zero vibrational state to the zero uh, vibrational state of the excited state. All the additional peaks are peaks due to the absorption from the zero vibrational state to excited vibrational states in the, in the excited state. Uh, now, this is the diagram that shows this process, absorption process, with the nuclear wave functions uh, on, uh, on, on the excited state and on the ground state. So um, this is on the wavelength scale, on the, on the wavelength axis. In the on the time axis, this process is very fast. Absorption is, is uh, almost instantaneous. Electrons are very light. Um, uh, they, they can move very fast. Uh, so therefore, this absorption process, th that means change uh, of the, uh, moving one electron from here to here, it's a, it happens really almost instantaneous. Okay, the fluorescence process. Let's take a, a, another molecule just because the previous molecule is not fluorescent at all. So all the energy that is uh, accumulated by absorption is basically dissipated through heat in the molecule. But uh, this molecule is pretty fluorescent. Once uh, an absorption is measured, so you can, you can record the fluorescence spectrum afterwards. This is the fluorescence uh, photon here. Um, and um, in this diagram, the wavelength would show also some peaks, and the peaks are due to the, uh, to the fact that the relaxation occurs from the ground state to different <coughs> vibrational, lev vibrational levels in the ground state, and you ha can measure a certain intensity, which is, due to the, uh, which is uh, uh, dependent on the fluorescence quantum yield, which is, shows how many, photons, uh, absor how many from the absorbed photons would convert into fluorescence photons, the rest of them would go, would dissipate through either a triplet state or through heat. Um, and uh, it shows that the process is very, very fast. Uh, I'm sorry, it's, it's rather slow compared to the, to, the, um, to the absorption. And it occurs on a nanosecond time scale. So the fluorescence is, uh, uh, can be described so as a spectrum, as a fluorescence lifetime that is often measured and it, uh, um, it, is, uh, it is helpful to know this in order to, uh, because it, it can um, allow us to distinguish between different fluorophores. Each fluorophore has a certain uh, decay time, typical. It may change uh, with, uh, with uh, changes in the um, temperature or pH, but uh, it is uh, a good indicator of, uh, of, of certain molecule. And then we, in tissue, for example, we have endogenous or exogenous fluorophores. Um, exo endogenous fluorophores are uh, fluorophores that are intrinsically fluorescent. So, uh, for example, we have NADH, we have flavins in tissue that are strongly fluorescent. Um, and exogenous fluorophores are the fluorophores that we introduce, we put into the tissues as fluorescent probes. Um, okay. Yes. So obviously the previous slide caught me thinking. So has the um, if you can measure the rate of light absorption, is that ever used experimentally? No, because it's too fast. Okay. It's too fast. Lasers are not that fast to, to measure this. Okay. So phosphorescence is uh, a process inter-system uh, uh, crossing. As between a singlet and triplet state and then relaxation via another photon is emitted. It's called, the photon is called phosphorescent photon. And uh, it is characterized by a, a, a certain uh, spectrum, which is again uh, showing the 
the relaxation from the ground state uh, of the triplet state to various vibrational levels in the, in the uh, electronic singlet state, the ground state. And the lifetime of phosphorescence is much larger than uh, fluorescence or, or the other processes. Uh, it can be go to milliseconds or even longer. So uh, let's go to scattering. Mean scattering is, uh, oops, I think it should be um, mean scattering here. Mean scattering has been discovered by Gustav Me, and uh, uh, it's basically elastic scattering. If you have these electronic levels in the molecule, uh, the, if, you, if you go with light that does not match yet an absorption level, uh, so it's, it's not resonant, it's not electronic resonance, uh, then the photon can be uh, elastically scattered. Um, and uh, mean scattering actually um, is mostly considered for objects that are uh, slightly larger than the wavelength of light. And uh, just to give you a few examples, scattering on clouds is, uh, an, is an example of mean scattering. That's what, that's what makes clouds uh, whitish. Um, scatter milk is a colloidal part, a colloidal structure. It's made out of uh, lipid uh, of, of particles that are few, non few micrometers in size. And because you have so many, they scatter so much, um, the color is white. Um, and there are many other examples that you can give. So, um, and this would be the Rayleigh scattering. Rayleigh scattering is the same process, except that it occurs on objects much smaller than, than the wavelength of light, which are molecules. It's a scattering on molecules. Again, elastic scattering. And the uh, Rayleigh scattering, uh, uh, the spectral distribution of Rayleigh scattering is different than that of the Mie scattering. Um, it follows an inverse to the four uh, dependence of, of the wavelength of light, which means that in blue it's much stronger than in the, in the red, uh, making the skies look blue. Uh, since you have more scattering in blue of blue light on uh, molecules in the atmosphere than in red. If you, have, if you start to have in the atmosphere larger particles, it will start, the, cloud will, the, the sky will start to look reddish or different color. Hmm? Yeah, 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 small, small, yeah. Isn't that that's basically what lights in the sunset the sky is, right? <laughs> okay, Raman scattering is a, um, it's a, an example of inelastic light scattering. So we've seen elastic light scattering. <coughs> inelastic refers to the fact that one photon is absorbed and then another photon is emitted, is scattered, but with a, with a, a frequency that is slightly different. And um, light scattering occur, occurs on, on um, when... Um, one photon is absorbed, another one is emitted, emitted, and the difference between the two photons uh, will match one uh, vibrational level, so the energy of, uh, of, a, vibra of a certain vibration in, in the molecule. Uh, you can imagine if you have more uh, vibrations, you have more peaks. Each vibration would give you one peak. So, um, therefore, Raman scattering can be very specific to uh, molecules. And it has, been, it has been used as an analytical tool to identify molecules. So it um, would be like a mass spec, but uh, uh, would work with uh, light. So Raman is better for single, single molecular analysis? As for molecular analysis, yes. But you can do it in bulk as well, except that if you have uh, more molecules, the spectra will start to overlap. This uh, discrimination will be more difficult. Not exactly. Maybe not single molecules, but single materials. Like simple, simple Mixtures, right? If, if you had a pure compound, right, that would give you a nice piece of spectrum. But when you have a very complex sample, many different compounds, then your compound spectrum gets really complicated. Okay, so uh, and you can have various types of uh, uh, technologies uh, that that utilize this effect, this scattering effect. And uh, the first one is the spontaneous Raman scattering, where you take a, you shine light uh, with, a sing, uh, with a single frequ frequency or a, a single wavelength uh, or narrow band wavelength uh, uh, light source, and you measure 
how the light is scattered and you get a set of peaks that, is, that uh, will reflect uh, your chemical contribution, uh, co chemical composition. And you have resonance Raman scattering and this happens whenever uh, your uh, input I incident photon matches a res an electronic resonance uh, in the molecule and would make the, the, sig the Raman signal much stronger, about uh, five orders of magnitude stronger due to the uh, electronic resonance. Then you have uh, coherent, uh, coherent Raman processes like coherent <coughs> anti stocks coherent stocks. I'm going to talk a little more in detail, but I will not have time to go in detail in each one. Um, surface enhanced Raman, stimulated Raman scattering. So um, the bottom line is there are many, uh, many ways you can exploit this process in order to look and identify, look at the sample and identify molecules in your sample. And uh, again, since, you, since it's uh, specific to chemical bonds, it can be very specific for molecules. It's, uh, it has intrinsic uh, chemical specificity, which is unmatched by any other uh, non-invasive technique. And uh, it actually enables you to look at molecules themselves without adding uh, labels. Uh, as you know, um, many fluorescent te techniques use uh, extrinsic uh, fluorophores, that means labels, that you add to your sample in order to follow a, a certain process. Raman would allow you to look at molecules uh, as they are in their native state. Well, if you're talking about resonance, Raman, say if you're using light with an energy that matches uh, electronic transition. Yes. So what determines whether fluorescence occurs or whether scattering occurs? The fluorescence will occur as well. So, and you will have a strong fluorescence signal. But for molecules that are, do not have strong fluorescence, uh, you could still measure a Raman spectrum. Um, and again, if you can um, eliminate somehow the fluorescence, I'm going to talk a little bit about that, how you can, uh, what can you uh, do to eliminate the fluorescence background, then uh, uh, it's very useful. Um, and also SIRS, surface enhanced Raman uh, scattering, can be done in resonance and the fluorescence is not an issue. Okay, so just to show you Raman spectra, here it's a, a cyclohexane, a simple molecule. So you have the, the laser beam and this is the main uh, Rayleigh scattering peak which, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, is not shifted. It, it has the same um, energy as the input photon, as the input uh, uh, beam. So this is your Rayleigh peak, and all the others are peaks due to uh, Raman scattering. And these are peaks due to anti-Stokes Raman scattering, just to go back a little bit. Um, Stokes Raman scattering happens when you take a molecule from the, from the ground vibrational level and you put it on the excited vibrational level. Anti-Stokes Raman scattering happens when you put a shorter, uh, you put a lower energy photon and you get a higher energy photon. This is called anti-Stokes Raman spectroscopy, which is much weaker than the Stokes, by the way. So if you look at this diagram, wavelength time, uh, you measure a spectrum again, like uh, you see here, and it's a very fast process, femtoseconds. Um, so it's one of the fastest pro uh, uh, processes. So Raman uh, scattering, um, because um, we were talking about it. So you have, uh, when, whenever you, you, your input uh, photon matches a, an electronic resonance, you start getting an enhancement in, 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 the, in the Raman scattering. And this is due to this uh, term here. The intensity of the Raman is proportional to the, to the uh, polarizability. Um, of the molecule, and if you have this um, difference in vibrational uh, energies matching uh, a, a, an energy level here, this term uh, gets very small, and uh, you get uh, an enhancement here. It's conservatively hundred to a thousand times. Uh, it can be uh, even five orders of magnitude. Uh, how could uh, what's this term with the the imaginary part? How this to understand? Uh, uh, yeah, in this equation where you... This is not an imaginary... This is not imaginary, but it's just vibrational... The one levels. below. Uh, the one in below. The, um, oh, this one. Yeah. Oh, the, the, the line width. Um, what do you mean? 
Yes, um, I always was wondering what, uh, why. So it is imaginary, but um, I, I can't really kind of like deal with it. Um. I'm not quite right. sure what's the sure equivalent of this term. Well, this is uh, related to the bandwidth of the of the uh, Raman resonance. Yeah, because I, so what I can see is um, the smaller the term mm -hmm. um, is. This one. Like the whole term, yeah, um, underneath the yeah the whole yeah, term. The, the whole term. Um, the better the Raman vibration is, mm -hmm. it's the stronger is your polarizability. Yes. Is that right? Right. But so how does contribute actually the yeah this. Well, for a certain molecule that has a certain, it's, like a it's a constant, so it's a co constant for, for a certain molecule, and of course for a, cer it's a, a certain tem temperature, but uh, what, uh, what you do here is you modify this term by tuning your laser, uh, not this one. And one more thing that uh, you can see on this slide is the following. So um, the Rama scattering, like any, like uh, the Rayleigh scattering process, depends uh, with the inverse to the lambda uh, to, the, uh, to the fourth power of the, w uh, of the uh, wavelength. So therefore, um, at 400 nanometers, you would get much stronger scattering than at 800, actually 16 times stronger, just by moving towards the blue, just another... Uh, uh, way to enhance the Raman scattering. But the downside is that once you move to blue excitation, you start having a lot of fluorescence problems. You uh, get into the resonance, um, abs resonant absorption, and the fluorescence will become significant. And um, actually, Raman scattering is much weaker. I think this is also maybe um, 10 to the 6, 10 to the 9 times weaker than the fluorescence. Uh, in then the fluorescence scattering. Okay, and this is what shows one more time the comparison in time, what happens in time with Raman versus fluorescence. Uh, Raman is very quick, very short. Uh, if you excite with a short laser, uh, Raman ever actually overlaps with your laser beam, and fluorescence decays over several nanoseconds. And uh, the idea here, uh, if you want to go in resonance and you want to increase your Raman signal by orders of magnitude um, <coughs> without uh, the contribution from, from fluorescence, you need to develop a gate that is very an optical gate that allows you to measure only Raman but uh, eliminate the fluorescence uh, background. And this is what would be the improvement if you have a very short gate here uh, uh, relative to the fluorescence lifetime. Okay. So, um, and now just um, as an overview of, of uh, all these processes in the, um, how light propagates through tissue. So if you have, a, if you have light that uh, you put on, on, on a tissue, this, are, this is a summary of, of uh, absorption processes um, due to different components, uh, melanin, uh, hemoglobin absorbed pretty strongly. Uh, um, you see oxygenated versus the oxygenated have slightly ab different absorption spectra. Proteins absorb uh, in uh, UV, so does DNA. And you have this water absorption. So this is, uh, the water starts to absorb quite strongly if you go to longer wavelengths. So uh, if you want to do measurements, actually this is your window. And in particular, if you want to penetrate deeper in the tissue, um, if you go here in this region, you have a lot of absorption and uh, the scattering becomes significant. Rayleigh scattering uh, follows this, uh, uh, this uh, curve. Me scattering follow this curve, follows this curve. But uh, if you go around the one micrometer, you see that you have less absorption and less scattering. So you have the best uh, possibility to go, to go deeper in tissue. If you go longer wavelength, uh, water absorption becomes significant. And uh, in terms of scattering, you can define a, free, a mean free path, which tells you how far a photon propagates before uh, interacting with, uh, with two molecules. And this can be uh, different for different types of tissue. For brain, it's uh, 50 to 100 micrometers. For, uh, uh, and depends on the wavelength, of course, because of this law here. Uh, at 800 nanometers, it's much longer. Um, so this, uh, this absorption basically limits your penetration depth. 
and it is very hard to go to deeper penetration depths uh, deeper than one millimeter unless you just collect photons that are scattered through the tissue, they do not keep uh, uh, information about their location, about they, where they are coming from. But you can uh, collect photons deeper than one millimeter, except they do not keep maintain their information. So if I put this laser to my finger, if I measure on the other side, some photons will make it through, but they will be scattered along uh, the path. So it, they will not tell me where the laser beam came in. They will just come out at some point and uh, it will lose basically their information. Okay, so this is, I think, uh, one more way to look at uh, the interactions. Um, so you have, this, the, uh, again, the, the previous diagram with the wavelength and the frequency, and what you can probe, basically. In this region, uh, you can probe uh, uh, vibration, vibration of uh, large groups, um, in this region, in the infrared, you can probe uh, um, this type of vibrations uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, energies. But in the visible, you can, uh, you can probe molecular uh, electronic states of absorption fluorescence, but also scattering, Raman scattering, will allow you to look at vibrational levels that you otherwise you would only be able to look when using infrared light. So uh, visible uh, light allows you to, to look at, at, many pro at many different uh, parameters. Okay, uh, and if you look at this, you can identify molecules, look at uh, inf different interactions, moni uh, monitor moni uh, morphological changes, manipulate and correlate with disease, so this is what, what uh, we're trying to do. Okay, let's go next to uh, semiconductors and actually to quantum dots. Quantum dots are semiconductor, uh, are small particles made out of semiconductor materials, gallium arsenide, for example. And uh, as they become very small, smaller than 10 nanometers, what, what, ha what happens is that you would have uh, quantum confinement. So that means the light, uh, so let me explain it a little better. Uh, so um, when the radius of the, of the dot becomes smaller than the Bohr radius, Bohr radius meaning the, ra the radius of the electron uh, orbiting uh, uh, the, the particle. So when, when this happens, um, very interesting properties occur, so which means, uh, uh, which allows you to, to, allows these particles to emit light when you shine light on them. So basically they absorb and they re-emit re light. But the emitted light depends on the size of the particles. And this is a very interesting property because it makes quantum dots usable as probes. So, for example, larger particles, uh, about 10 nanometers, will uh, emit in red. Small particles will emit in blue. They would all be excited with, uh, with one uh, wavelength, around uh, 350, 400 nanometers. But depending on their size, they will emit at different wavelengths which makes them very, very useful uh, in, uh, in, in many applications. However, they are toxic, like uh, semiconductors uh, are, and um, this limits their applicability in, uh, in, in vi for, for in vivo uh, use. Um, there are uh, groups that are trying to functionalize them in a way that uh, makes them uh, less toxic. And they are pretty good... Uh, um, they are pretty good at doing that, so there, there is hope that maybe they will be less toxic and can be used. Uh, so basically what you do with them, you, you put, you add, uh, you functionalize them. Basically you add a polymer coating, you make, a, uh, you have your core, you add a polymer coating, and you add biomolecules that makes, make them specific for certain, uh, uh, for certain molecules, for, cer for certain proteins or antibodies. And this allows the de de detection of those uh, molecules. Okay, so uh, with uh, the next one with metals, interaction with metals, and in particular, um, I'm going to talk about plasmons. So uh, plasmons are basically oscillations or uh, plasma oscillations in, uh, in metals. And plasmons are quasi-particles associated with these oscillations. Uh, plasma is nothing else but a, uh, an electron gas. So electrons moving 
in the in the metal will uh, oscillating in the metal will create these particles that are called plasmons. So it's collective oscillation. Uh, they are basically collective oscillations of free electron gas. And uh, plasmons um, have very interesting properties. Uh, I mean, uh, um, metallic nanoparticles <coughs> that are um, that uh, um, have this uh, that y you can generate these plasmons in. So, for example, they scatter light very strongly, and this has been used uh, even um, in the Middle Ages for cathedral windows, uh, giving the bright color. Very, uh, very, um, um, you know, non-fading color, basically, um, of, uh, of cathedral windows. These are just metal particles in there, in different sizes, would give you different colors. Um, and this is all based on how the light interacts with this, uh, with this metallic spheres. So, uh, the light is uh, an electric and a magnetic field. So, but if we consider only the electric field, because uh, the electric field would interact with, them, with the uh, electrons in the particle, uh, what you have here in the particle, electrons that are moving and following the electric field. Electric field is periodic here. In the, the photons, uh, the, 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 uh, the laser beam will come with an electric field that oscillates periodically, and this is the wavelength of light, basically. So it oscillates really, really fast. So these electrons will move really, really fast trying to follow the uh, electric field of the laser. And if they can follow it, you have a resonance. At, uh, at, uh, and, and this resonance basically uh, makes uh, light being absorbed by these metals. And uh, absorption depends on the size. Absorption can be invisible, around 500, 600 nanometers, and strongly depends on the size of the particles. Uh, 100 nanometers particles, for example, absorb around 570 or 580. Very small particles will absorb around 500. You can make all kinds of uh, uh, metallic uh, shapes, not only spheres. You can make, make rods, nanorods. Nanorods will have two absorption peaks. One due to the longitudinal absorption, and, and this would be uh, the longer uh, wavelength peak because the size is it's, it's a longer part, and one due to the uh, transversal uh, absorption. And you can make them uh, hollow, so they are hollow uh, metallic particles that um, uh, allow you to tune this absorption even to longer wavelengths in, in uh, near infrared. Okay, so now we have this plasmon, uh, plasmons that we know how to make, and we know to make uh, structures that uh, allow a certain absorption in, in, a, in a range that we want. So, going back to the cathedral window example, I mean, you explained here that uh, metallic particles, nanoparticles of a particular size, will have resonances that increase absorption of light. Mm -hmm. So then how do those function to make color? Th those, those are scattered, uh, scattered light, basically. Co a combination of absorption and, and scattering. Uh, so once we make these uh, particles, uh, how can we use them? So let's say that we have a, a, a surface that is rough, uh, mimicking basically uh, uh, small particles, and we uh, add molecules to it. Uh, what it has been observed in quite uh, early on, without being properly understood at that time, not even now it's not uh, properly understood. So you see a strong enhancement in the Raman uh, scattering, and by uh, many, many orders of magnitude. It's a really, really interesting phenomenon. So uh, molecules that you couldn't measure a Raman spectrum because they were so fluorescent, like rhodamine uh, and other fluorescent molecules, uh, now suddenly you don't see so much fluorescence, you see a Raman spectrum. And... Uh, um, even you can go down to measure the Raman spectra of single molecules. Uh, so there are several uh, different theories of how uh, the, or what is the mechanism of enhancement of Raman signal. And two of them I'm presenting here. There is still a controversy of uh, what um, is the main. Uh, actually, it is known what is the main mechanism, but uh, there is uh, still there are still discussions on um, if, this, if there is an, any, something else going on there. 
So uh, there is a, an, I'm starting with electromagnetic enhancement uh, because this is apparently the main uh, component, the, 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 pro the process, that, the mechanism that gives the largest enhancement. So uh, again, when you come with, a, with, a flu with an oscillating field and you move your electrons in the, in the metallic sphere, you create dipoles here. And um, these dipoles would create, a, 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 in turn, would create a strong electric field that would <coughs> go outside of the metallic sphere. And this, will, this strong electric field will uh, basically excite your, your molecules that are attached to the, to the particle. And there is a charge transfer uh, complex theory where you would have um, a charge transfer between these electrons can go to, you, to the can migrate between between the molecule and the particle itself, and this would give an additional uh, two orders of magnitude or so. So to understand a little better what happens, let's take two spheres, and you have let's say a molecule in between the two spheres here and in between the two spheres here, and you go with different polarization of light. So. When you go with polarized light that goes this way, the electrons will move this way. You create a dipole moment this way. The enhancement is only what it, this molecule would only feel the enhancement to due, due to the dipole moment uh, inside the sphere. However, when you polarize, uh, when you go with polarized light oriented this way, you move for both particles, the electric charges, positive charge would accumulate to the right and negative to the left. So basically you have an electric field here uh, that is much stronger than the electric field uh, across the, uh, the particle. The reason being that you can put these particles, this, uh, this particle very close, one nanometer, and the electric field uh, uh, depends strongly on the, on the distance, so increases strongly with the distance. The smaller the distance, distance the larger the, the electric field. So you can get huge enhancements if your particle is uh, trapped between, uh, between metallic particles in this uh, orientation. Okay, so what you can, uh, you can measure uh, Raman spectra and compare with SIRS spectra. SIRS are, again, the spectra, Raman spectra that are strongly enhanced by the presence of, of, uh, of uh, metallic particles. What you observe, first of, first of all, that uh, Raman and SIRS, uh, they are slightly different. And these are measured on uh, amino acids. And you, you can see slight small differences, um, which are accounted for, uh, considering that uh, the SIRS it's uh, almost a resonant process. The resonance Raman uh, is slightly different than the, than the, than the uh, non-resonant Raman in the sense that certain vibrations will be preferentially enhanced than others. You will not enhance everything. You will enhance only certain vibrations. And this is what you would see here in the SIRS. In the non-resonant Raman, you would tend to see all the vibrations. Okay, so uh, just a, a diversion. So what else you can do with this metallic particles for the biophotonics field? Um, you can send light through periodic holes, metallic holes, and you get uh, different colors out of it. Or you can even start to uh, design... Um, subsurface uh, circuits, uh, I'm sorry, sub-wavelength circuits. Um, circuits that are, uh, electric circuits uh, that uh, are so small, smaller than the, the wavelength of a light, using plasmons, basically using um, electric uh, charges or, or this uh, collective oscillations of, uh, of electric gas. All right. So, uh, Let's go next to linear versus nonlinear interactions. Whenever you have strong electric fields, that are you have a light that you have a laser pulse, for example, that is very strong. You have a high number of photons coming at once in your sample. Your electric field will be huge. Uh, the, the material responds by uh, an induced polarization, and the induced polarization uh, will have different turns. Uh, we'd have the linear term, the linear response, but we'd have additional nonlinear terms uh, if the electric field is very strong. And you start seeing all these uh, uh, nonlinear effects like second harmonic generation, some frequency, third harmonic um, 
and so on. Uh, some of the more important for what we are concerned is four-wave mixing, uh, second harmonic, and maybe the Kerr effect. Um, and all these phenomena will give you, uh, will allow you to generate, first of all, supercontinuum lasers, um, which means that you, uh, now it doesn't, it doesn't have directly to do with light interacting with the matter and uh, with biological matter, but um, these nonlinear processes, when you, when you focus light into fibers that are very small, they have a very small core, you start uh, adding up all these uh, nonlinear effects and you generate multiple wavelengths. You start with one wavelength and what's coming out of the laser is basically white light, which is very useful because it has the properties of light. It can be uh, collimated, has co some coherence, and um, uh, it's, again, unidirectional. So, um, what else you can do? You can do spectroscopy on mic and microscopy on uh, using coherent anti stokes Raman, coherent stokes uh, stimulated Raman. Um, or you can do second harmonic using second harmonic generation. Third harmonic, uh, uh, um, this is different frequency generation microscopy. Or you can do optical switching using curve effect. Now, this is probably a little too much, but just to <laughs> it, it would be a lecture for each one, probably. <laughs> so, which I'm, I think uh, you're going to <coughs> see a lecture for cars. You're going to see a lecture for, um, for. I'm not James, sure. James will talk about cars, and then uh, Thomas will talk about uh, nonlinear second harmonic. Okay, second harmonic. Okay. I don't know so, about optical switching. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about optical switching now. So, uh, about optical switching. So, wh when you have a nonlinear material and you come with a, a strong pulse in it. The, your pulse will induce birefringence in that material, will, will make the light pass uh, faster in one axis than in the other axis. So what it means is that at some point, uh, the light traveling faster, when it comes out, will basically interfere with the light going slower, and you have a phase shift between the two. So the phase, if the phase shift matches a certain, uh, it's actually a half wavelength shaped phase shift, what happens is that the polarization will rotate 90 degrees. So uh, it's acting actually as a, a polarization switch. Now, if you put inside your nonlinear material Raman and fluorescent signal together, um, and uh, you polarize them, it's, it's coming polarized. You put an analyzer that blocks everything that comes out. Now you come with another laser through the nonlinear material. You run everything, you overlap everything here. And now you overlap, you come with a short pulse that overlaps only with the Raman signal. And it will switch the polarization 90 degrees only for the Raman signal. The Raman signal will start going through because it has the right polarization to go through now. The fluorescence will not go through because the pulse will stop immediately after the Raman and uh, the polarization will be uh, perpendicular on the analyzer. So uh, it basically is blocked. So this is uh, the principle of a fast uh, optical switch, uh, which can be used for, uh, for this purpose, for separating Raman and fluorescence, but can be used for other applications as well. This is a different approach than what you were talking about with time gated. This is the approach. This is actually, uh, there are different schemes that you can do this, um, but this is uh, the basic scheme. Okay, so, uh, and there are different uh, nonlinear materials that you can use uh, um, for this process uh, with the various response time. Basically, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So, uh, depending on what material uh, you have, you, you can have an electronic or nuclear response, which means the, the birefringence that you induce, it can be due only to uh, deforming electron cloud or to moving uh, nuclei. In, in the material. So the nuclear, nucle nuclear movement is much slower. So the response will be much slower. So if you, if whenever you have a nuclear contribution, your gate will be, uh, will be larger. You will have a, um, uh, a longer optical gate. So water and uh, few silica have uh, only electronic contributions. CS2 uh, tends to orient molecules. So that means nuclear motion and so on. Okay, so very few, uh, very little about photonics instrumentation. And um, 
actually just a, just a concept. Should we wait for... How much of it do you already have? Did you already know? I think you know. Like <laughs> it's maybe a different perspective, but you know. Yeah, yeah no, I, I, I mean, I have to heard like, probably everything. Uh -huh. It's interesting to see it again. And just uh -huh. But for Colin, I think it's... Yeah, I think for him it's probably more important. That's, that's what I actually uh, meant before. So how do you calculate then the um, the uh, polarizability from a material? Okay. Do you have the imaginary component there? Oh, oh, oh. So if I would like to calculate that just to predict it, mm -hmm. you know, how, how that uh, would I have to multiply it complex with the complex quantities of it? I don't know exactly, sir. Okay. I, I was just wondering because I was already uh, some part had like some imaginary numbers inside and I was like, okay, but how do I you know, use that sound? Okay, so uh, let me continue because we're going to be uh, out of time soon. So, uh, the biophotonics technologies, I would split it into three different categories, uh, imaging and microscopy technologies, sensors and assays, where you try to identify certain molecules using certain um, in specific interactions, and uh, by, for diagnostics and uh, devices designed for diagnostics and therapies. There are a wide range of imaging and microscopy technologies that you, most of them, you know, absorption fluorescence and so on, some of them more um, used than others. There are more exotic ones like uh, um, bioluminescence, even though it's becoming very much used now. Um, but uh, from the sensor side, you have the ELISA uh, immunosorbent uh, imu enzyme-linked immunosorbent assays, microarrays, uh, uh, surface plasma resonance assays, and, and so on. Um, and fiber optic sensors. And very few actually that devices that made it actually into uh, diagnostics and therapies, which is uh, um, a few of them pass oximetry, ex oximetry uh, optical bio biopsy. Laser capture microdissection is one technique that is actually very used in pathology to when you coat uh, your sample with, uh, with um, a foil, plastic foil and you shine a UV laser and where you shine the UV laser it heats up and you capture basically only a few cells in that region. Uh, and this is uh, something that is very much used. Uh, there are um, <coughs> devices that are aimed at image-guided sur surgery and even laser ablation. Okay, but a common arrangement, just uh, conceptually uh, speaking, uh, a common arrangement for imaging the microscopy. So first I'm going to talk about imaging microscopy, then a little bit about sensors. Uh, you have a, the object that you shine light on, you need a, a light source, uh, you, have, you need your object, you need some uh, elements in between, and you need a tuning element, and, and of course, the detector. Uh, the, de the detector is usually a CCD or, um, or a point detector, uh, whatever you like. The tuning element can be a wavelength tuning element, can be a time tuning el element, and so on. Uh, the excitation light is your um, laser or other or other light that you're using. So you, you measure absorption, emission, or scattering. And what you can come up with, you come with an image uh, in, one, in, two di in two dimensions, and in, in the other dimension you can come with a spectrum, you can come with a temporal response, polarization of phase response. So you, you can build a cube, basically, that will contain a lot of information about your sample. Um, and of course, you can just take a 3D image if this uh, distance, if this uh, uh, axis is uh, just length again. So and you build a cube that is uh, a very large, uh, contains a lot of uh, data. Um, uh, 2D, uh, it has one million pixels. If you add one more dimension, uh, only 100 points, you would uh, already have 10 to the 8 pixels, which is becoming a challenge in some. 
Okay, so light sources, uh, very briefly, you have uh, in the visible range um, the choice of many uh, lasers. Um, these are gas lasers, many of them. Uh, some of them are uh, solid state lasers, you have solid state uh, gas dye lasers. You have higher harmonic lasers when you go to, uh, to blue or ultraviolet. And you have synchrotron lasers in the BPV. You have terahertz lasers in the terahertz region. And then you may have continuums, continuum wave lasers that emit light continuously. And you have certain uh, power for, for the laser and certain power density that you can achieve when you focus these uh, lasers onto the sample. Uh, laser power is 5 milliwatts is usually what is mostly used when you do microscopy and you focus on a, on a tight spot. And this is about the energy that a laser pointer gives you. So a laser pointer would be a good source for, <laughs> for microscopy. Uh, then you have pulse lasers, and the, pulse, uh, the duration of the pulse can range anywhere between milliseconds and several femtoseconds um, with different repetition rate, of an average power that uh, may match that of the, of the CW. Energy per pulse uh, are relatively low, but when you focus this light, you start to get very high power densities compared to the CW lasers. You basically focus a lot of energy, a very large number of photons in a very short period of time uh, on your sample. So you start getting into the nonlinear regime. Okay, so uh, and if you want to do imaging, then you can point scan your object. You scan your uh, either the object or the laser beam, a uh, single point, or you can do a line scanning. Um, you can do a slit scanning, or you can do uh, multiple uh, slits, uh, doing a whole, uh, recording a whole image at the same time. Um, now, if you want to tune the wavelength, you can tune uh, um, with uh, various, uh, in different ways. You can tune it using uh, uh, regular gratings or uh, uh, spectrometers based on grading based spectrometers or prism based spectrometers or using simple filters or you can use uh, AOTFs which are tunable filters, acoustic optical tunable filters, tunable filters. It's, uh, these are basically large crystals that you shine the light through them, the whole image, and by applying RF frequencies into them, you change the, uh, the you create a transient uh, grating. Uh, by the acoustic waves will, will create a transient grating in the, in the crystal acting like, basically like a, like a dispersion element. And then you can record different images or you can have volumetric uh, gratings and so on. Just to give you an example, um, spectral imaging where you record images at different wavelengths um, and um, the reason why you would do that is uh, very, very obvious. So uh, spectral images, uh, imaging allows you to record an image that uh, will contain quantifiable information about the wavelength uh, in the, on, each, on each pixel. So the reason is the eye is kind of tricky uh, when, it, it, the, when you record the color. It's very sensitive. It's very sensitive to record differences in, in color, especially in the green area. But uh, because of the background, this red appears to be different than this red, which is, in fact, is the same. And so is this. This green is the same as this, this green, but because of the different background, it looks uh, different. So the eye uh, has the capability to distinguish between different colors, but it's not quantitative. So, uh, and this would allow you to do a quantitative measurements, me measurement when you record uh, multiple uh, images at multiple wavelengths, and you can quantify your image, uh, what, what is the wavelength for each uh, pixel. And you can do the same in time. You can do it, uh, again, as in wavelength, or you can do the same in time by recording at different times after you excite with a short pulse and you measure images at different uh, <coughs> uh, time uh, um, interval after your excitation pulse, a few nanoseconds after that, 
following the excitation, for following the decay, uh, fluorescence decay time. And if you look at the same image here, you see uh, you get uh, two different colors, or you can get two different lifetimes. So there are mainly two components in, your, in this image. Okay, a little bit about um, assays. Um, so when you're talking about assays, you, you, it's basically uh, you're talking about detecting uh, certain molecules of interest. Uh, and uh, the mostly used probably assay currently existing is the ELISA uh, assay, which is uh, enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. So uh, when you put a, a capturing antibody, you deposit it on, on some, something, and you want to detect an antigen. So the antigen will be specific for your capturing agent. Then you come with a detection uh, kit. A detection kit will, will contain an antibody that binds to the antigen and will, buy, will contain a secondary antibody that is, lab, that is specific for the, first, for the primary antibody. But it has also a, a fluorescent label. So whenever um, something, whenever your, your uh, antigen binds to the, to the antibody, then you have uh, a fluorescent signal that you can measure. And this is the way they detect, basically, a uh, small concentration of uh, antibodies in the blood, for example, due to the presence of viruses, uh, of, uh, of viral infections, previous virus, viral infections. Uh, they all have, uh, in blood, well, you will have circulating through your blood uh, antibodies that are present, probably some of them for the lifetime. Uh, and it's easy to detect with using this assay um, if you ever had hepatitis, for example, <laughs> or, um, or other uh, viral infections. Not all of them, I believe. You know better than me, <laughs> Frank, but not everything works. Uh, for, for, uh, does it work for, H, for uh, HIV, too? Anything that you can create, if you can find an antibody against a particular molecule, then you can develop an assay against that. The traditional ELISA assay, there is a small sphere there that's supposed to represent a fluorophore or some kind of a color agent. But the original ELISA is an enzyme that can produce a color change. And so without actually having to see the molecule, you can see in the well or the test tube a change in the color. And that color change indicates that whatever it is you're looking for is present in that sample. Because the enzyme will continue to produce more and more color. So it's like, it's like photofilm, the longer you do an exposure, the darker it gets. And so here, basically, um, that would be how, how that would I think about isolating the body. Yeah, so that'll be a separate lecture, actually. Um, I'm, I'm hoping to spot that in on how, you know, how to work. So, yeah, um, there's, a whole, there's a whole separate field to um, developing a pure function. So the role of biophotonics here is to detect this fluorescence. Yeah. Basically, everything else is uh, uh, chemistry and uh, yeah, biology. Yeah, biology. <laughs> so, but the different assays are developed besides this one, and uh, they are aimed to detect lower and lower concentrations of, uh, of antibodies <coughs> or proteins present in, in serum, and also to be more specific. So, oftentimes it's important to be specific. So, SIRS can be used to surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy, so the use of metallic nanoparticles. Uh, to enhance the Raman spectrum. This can, this uh, metallic particles can be also used as, uh, as uh, assays. So when you have your uh, uh, capturing uh, antibody and you ha you come with your um, with your uh, with your protein of interest, then you you design your metallic particle to be to to have. Uh, um, an antibody specific for this antigen. And uh, if this happens, it, it will bind to the antigen, and the, then you have the whole construct, and when you shine light, you can detect Raman. And uh, you have also a Raman probe here, so you can detect Raman from this Raman probe. Uh, so eventually, it will be very specific, because Raman is more specific than fluorescence. fluorescence. Oh, these uh, assays are basically sandwich assays, because you put your antigen between two uh, antibodies. So there are uh, ways uh, that, uh, and we are also trying to develop ways to, for direct detection of, of uh, proteins um, by uh, uh, immobilizing uh, nanoparticles on a glass substrate, and then you come with uh, 
um, with um, optimers. Optimers are short uh, DNA sequences that are uh, single-stranded DNA sequences that uh, um, are specific for certain are designed to be specific for certain proteins. And uh, you coat this particle with optimers, and when you have your molecules, of molecule of interest will bind. To, the, to this, and then you, you measure a Raman spectrum of the protein itself without, without using a Raman probe or a fluorescent molecule. This um, is still in development, and it's a very difficult uh, thing to do. Okay, so uh, anyway, um, I just wanted to point to you two main things when you, do, when you try to develop biophotonics technologies. First thing is the resolution limit. So you cannot see objects that are smaller than half the wavelength of light. So light, uh, as it is, is much better than any other imaging methods, um, MRI or ultrasound, uh, uh, X-ray. They do not give you a resolution better than millimeters. Uh, light will give you uh, better than one micrometer. But still, it's not uh, unlimited. You have a, a certain limit, uh, and it's, uh, it's called diffraction limit. Uh, because the light uh, it's, uh, follows the, the uh, diffraction laws. So basically you cannot focus on a very small spot. So if you want to look at molecules, you, only you can only detect their presence based on their spectrum. But you cannot see them directly. So there are developments to make microscopes, optical microscopes, uh, um, to, to have higher resolution. And uh, we have uh, at CBSD one uh, such instrument that uh, improves the, re the resolution, the spatial resolution, by two to five times. There are other groups in the world that claim uh, even higher improvement in the spatial resolution, going down to, uh, I guess, 10 nanometers or so. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a big field, and um, uh, many people are trying to uh, to increase the resolution. The other issue uh, is really the penetration depth. Uh, with ultrasound and other imaging technologies, you can penetrate uh, through, through the whole body, not with light, because of, the, of absorption and scattering. You can only penetrate for a few, uh, at best, few millimeters. And uh, there are uh, technologies aimed at improving the penetration depth. One way is to use lasers that are uh, in, the, in, in this particular region where we have less absorption and from, from the intrinsic models, but also do not go into the uh, water absorption. Um, so this, uh, there are uh, several developments in, in the area as well. Okay, so in summary, so we went through all this through uh, what is light, what is matter, how they interact, uh, interaction with molecules, with semiconductors, with metals, and we saw linear versus nonlinear interaction in some uh, biophotonics technologies. So I think that's all. Thank you. <laughs> <The> questions. <laughs>